Hey everyone, I thought I would do a quick video on linguistic universals and their applicability to conlanging. First, if you haven't heard of linguistic universals, they're usually of the variety all languages do X or no languages do Y. Uh, these are called absolute linguistic universals. The idea is that if there is an absolute linguistic universal, every single human language on the planet should do whatever it's talking about or should not do whatever it's talking about. There are also, uh, I guess, little weaker versions of linguistic universals, which are called implicational universals. And that is, if a language does X, then it will also do Y. An example of the former would be uh, all languages have nouns and verbs. This is a common linguistic universal that all human languages seem to adhere to. Uh, often you'll hear the claim that, oh, there, there are languages that uh, don't make a distinction between nouns and verbs. Um, usually that's, that claim is made for, for example, uh, Polynesian languages. But in Hawaiian, there, I think there are very, very clear syntactic categories of noun and verb, even if you can use the exact same lexeme to fill both slots uh, without any kind of morphology. I mean, that happens a lot, like, you know, um, I don't know, hey noho aoi noho means I am sitting in a chair. Where noho means sit and it also means chair. But, um, you know, it's pretty obvious which one, the noun, which one is a noun and which one is a verb and its, and its category is very, very strong. So Hawaiian distinguishes between nouns and verbs, it just uses the same stuff for both sometimes. Um, implicational universals are, for example, things like where you would say um, a language that has a word for foot will also have a word for hand. This is coming from, uh, there are many languages that don't distinguish between the, uh, like distinguish a word for hand from a word for arm, they'll use the same word for both. Same thing for leg and foot. But the idea is if you have a language where there is a word for foot, then it should also have a word for hand. Um, that's the basic idea. That's probably painting universals in the rosiest way possible. Um, but what I would like to suggest, Ab Conlang, is that these things are completely and totally non-useful for conlangers. First of all, the only major linguistic universals they are are so unbelievably generic that they're not even very inter interesting to discuss. For example, like I think even claiming that all languages have nouns and verbs is even a, a little bit more interesting than probably you would want to claim for all languages. Usually you want to make a claim something like, a, a universal would be a language conveys meaning in some way, which is, I mean, yeah, it's basically the definition of what language does. If you can find any, if you can imagine any possible language that doesn't convey meaning of any kind, then one would ask, well, is it a language? Um, those are the types of really, really uh, universal linguistic universals that, um, that I think you can come up with. They're not many in number and they're not really interesting to think about and they're not really useful uh, to think about. The implicational universals uh, could be potentially interesting, but they kind of remind me uh, a lot of the, um, the conversation that Bender has with the god robot in that episode of Futurama where he asks the, the, the god robot, he's like, do you know what I'm going to do before I do it? And it responds, yes. Bender says, what if I do something different? Then I don't know that. <laughs> like, all right. <laughs> That's basically what happens with a lot of these universals. They say, all right, starts out as an absolute. All languages do this. Then, of course, uh, the linguists from Australia say, oh, we have all of these languages that don't do this specifically. And they say, all right, well, then um, all languages don't do that. But most languages do that. And it's like, okay, that's fine. But it's not really telling you anything. And it's not actually useful for a conlinger, the one who's actually building this stuff. The idea is that these, these linguistics universals might point to um, either physio well, they're no, probably not physiological constraints, but, but psychological or cognitive constraints put on languages. Um, and if they do, then that's interesting. But the universals themselves are just kind of blind observations, kind of like you could make about anything. I'm like, I don't know, let's say if this were my sample size for a ruler, then I, would, I could say that all rulers are made out of wood. They all have uh, 12 inches on them, and they all also have centimeters on one side, and then they're also chewed off on one side. But then it's like, okay, then you pull up a plastic ruler and suddenly like, oh, my universal that all rulers are made out of wood, wood is now false. Okay, they're either made out of wood or plastic. 
Then you show me another ruler that's made out of glass. It's like, okay, all rulers are made out of wood, plastic, or glass. That's a universal. But it's like, you know, it's, it's ignoring the kind of obvious facts about what rulers are. Same thing with language, except that we can't, we don't really know enough about language to know everything about it. And so that's why we have the universals. For the conlanger, though, you have to, I think you, it's, it's upon you, if you would like, to supply those answers. They're probably going to be wrong, but they will be true within the context of your language. And that's interesting. Talking a bit more about implicational universals, there are a lot of what I call common sense or obvious uh, implicational universals. So for example, one of them is that if a language has a trial number, that is exactly three of something, then it will have a dual number. And it's like, well, sure. I mean, that seems pretty obvious because if, if a language is going to evolve something for exactly three of something, why wouldn't, and also exactly one of something, presuming it as a singular, why wouldn't it do exactly two of something? Why would it have a plural that accounted for four or more and then also exactly two of something? Um, and then something separate that was for exactly three. It just doesn't make sense. Um, that doesn't really tell us anything very special about language. That just tells us something about humans and wanting to do things that are obvious. Um, kind of like uh, it would seem, you know, really kind of churlish to have uh, a singular, a plural for everything except, except exactly 17 of something, and then also a separate form for exactly 17 of something. Um, it just seems silly, but it doesn't mean to take uh, the, a leap that many, uh, that many, no, I'm going to back up, to take a leap that some have made and shouldn't, so hopefully that isn't you, and probably most linguists I say wouldn't say this, it doesn't mean that it is uh, psychologically, uh, you know, uh, relevant or that the language is unlearnable. I think it would be very, very easy to learn a language that had exactly three numbers. Uh, one of something, many of something, but not 17, and then exactly 17 of something. It would be very easy language to learn. I mean, that's just three morphological forms. Anybody can learn something with three morphological forms. And, and also numbers, I don't know, it, it, it's simple. We don't often talk about 17. It's a prime number. What, what comes in exactly 17? Oh, brother. I, I really want to hear about something that comes in exactly 17. Man, there's got to be something. I'm thinking of it. I don't know. It's a common football score, uh, American football score, because, you know, it's two touchdowns and a field goal, presuming you made all the extra points. But anyway, um, so uh, these things are not necessarily going to be as useful in, for example, determining whether a conling is real realistic or not. Um, it's more about the story about how you got there. So for example, if you have a word for foot and leg, but then only one word for hand and arm, why? Um, how did that happen? Uh, you know, one, one good example that I could think of is that the people that actually speak this language don't actually have hands, but they do have separate feet. I'm imagining some sort of praying mantis type creature. Yeah, it has the, but do they have separate feet? I think they do. I don't know a lot about praying mantises. That's why I don't do videos about them or their physiology. It wouldn't make sense. I know a little bit about language. So that's why I do that. Um, anyway, but uh, so yeah, so it's not as if, if something violates even an implicational universal. It's not as if that language is unlearnable. It may be unevolvable in the sense that it's just so nonsensical that why would anybody do it? but it certainly won't be unlearnable. Um, same thing like, you know, something that should be common to all languages is that if they have pronouns, they have a first person singular pronoun, but you could totally get by without that. Um, even a universal that all languages have pronouns, you could get by without that. Just use the person's name. And if there's more than one of them, use their last name. And if there's more than one of those, use their middle name. And if there's more than one of those, say, uh, append a, uh, a relative clause. So it's like, no, not that David J. Peterson, the David J. Peterson that I know. And always say that. You could do that. It's just kind of not very helpful. And it would make sentences a lot longer. So it's kind of a, a, it's kind of a dumb way to use a language. But you can do it. And it's perfectly learnable and perfectly easy to do. Um, so, you know, I guess where I come down on this is... I guess look at linguistic universals if they inspire you or if you find them interesting 
or if for some reason you decide, oh, I want to try to make a language that violates some of these, but it won't necessarily be something that's going to be you know, super interesting. It's like it's it's not an achievement to violate an implicational universal and say, oh, but look, you can still use the language. It's kind of like, well, duh. That's re that's really not um, at least for conlingers. It's not it's not a tough feat. If you admit that these things are just a lot of them are just common sense things about how humans go about their lives, then it's not very interesting to learn that they can actually learn to do something slightly different. Um, for example, like just using just using a different pronoun, a different version of you with somebody who is a, a different um, house in Harry Potter. It would be very easy to learn how to do. You just would need to have some sort of backup default pronoun uh, to refer to them if you didn't know what house they belong to. Very, very simple, very unrealistic, totally unevolvable. It would never happen. Anyway, so that is, uh, that is my, my opinion on the relationship between linguistic universals and conlanging. Um, if you ever want to see what a bunch of languages do, I of course recommend the World Atlas of Language Structures. That'll give you an idea for uh, a, given, a given scenario. How likely is it to show up in a world where there are a bunch of languages that have naturally evolved? Um, and then you can do with that information as you wish. That's it for this episode of ObConlang. If you have an issue that you'd like me to discuss, feel free to leave it in the comments or send me an email to djpquery at gmail.com. Uh, if you want to see more episodes like this one, feel free to subscribe. Thanks for watching.